Hey, what is up everybody? It's Odin here. Uh, another week in the books. Another video that I get to make for, for you guys, whoever's curious and wants to hear about what's going on. <clears throat> so it has been uh, quite a busy week. Um, officially my last day at my former employer, Op All Pack Container, <laughs> was Friday. So... Uh, I am in limbo between jobs right now, which is perfect because I have a lot to do this week to get ready for moving uh, to the Middle East, the Middle East, <laughs> the Midwest. How, how much different is that? You could say the Mideast and it's clear across the world. If you say Midwest, it's here in the heartland. But anyway, I digress. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, if you didn't catch my last video, I accepted a position with Bass Pro Shops to be their structural packaging design engineer, uh, which means I'll be designing all of their in-house packaging, basically. And uh, it's a new position they just created, and I'm the guy, apparently. So excited for that. They're an amazing employer so far. They've treated me like royalty, which has been, you know, nothing short of awesome. And, um, yeah, so I said so long to one job, said so hello to another, and I'll start there at the end of the month. So I got to get everything packed and ready before I leave. And then, uh, in the meantime, that's what I'm doing. I also have a uh, shove soon to be sent to me. Uh, saw the, the printed versions. They look great. Shared it out there. So that's exciting. And I'm hoping to get those before, with enough time to fulfill them before I move. Everything's like Cracker Jack timing. So we'll see. And then, <laughs> I got something cool. Uh, so real quick, the drawing I have shown here. It's just a page from Shrev Volume 2 that I've shown on here before. It's an older page. I just needed something to throw up there. I haven't been drawing as much as I wish I was. Uh, because uh, I've been busy, so... So I just threw a page up there just to have a drawing up on my other camera. Um, but I <laughs> had something come up the day I was leaving, my last day at work, a uh, gal I worked with came in with this big box full of unbagged, unboarded, uh, I guess you'd say Bronze Age, post, but right on the cusp, Bronze, Silver Age, comic books. Just big box full of them. Now, they weren't bagged, they weren't boarded, but as I looked through them, they were in a pretty, pretty good condition. And she said, uh, hey, if you want this, you can have it for 25 bucks. And I guess there was probably about 100. Turns out there was more like uh, 200, almost 250 in there. So I said, yeah, yeah, 25 bucks, I'll take it. I hope, hoping to find some gems. And I did find some gems, but I think some savvy person... Uh, I had already picked some of the better ones. Uh, and I'll go through some of that. So I had to get a bunch of bags and boards, and I've actually been doing that. Like, I needed something else to be doing, like a hole in the head, but I was like, I just bought all these. I want to, you know, they're in good condition. I want them to stay that way. So, so I have a whole lot of them, uh, various titles. And so I went to the comic book store. I got bags and boards and a couple long it actually filled a long box and a half of books so um so yeah i could show some of that and while i was at the store getting all that other stuff spending money i shouldn't be i came across a book that i couldn't live without and i ended up buying that as well which is a uh, another frank frazetta book this one was uh, a great size and the reproductions were really good uh, not sure when this one came out. Oh, I already killed my camera, so I'll have to hold things up, which means I can just move that out of there. But I like this, uh, opening to show, um, a black and white drawing, one of my favorites. I really love that one, uh, like a Mongolian warrior. This... Frazetta book. Vanguard Productions. That's not the newest one, I don't think. Well, the first printing was in 2020. 
This is the fourth printing, so so it's pretty new. But the reproductions and uh, the way it was laid out was really, really cool. It started with a lot of black and white work, uh, which was great. I love watch looking at his inks, and then it moves on to the gallery of paintings. And holding these up isn't going to do it nearly as much justice as uh, uh, looking under my other camera. But it was cool, they had like, on a lot of these, like various angles. So I show this, and then when you flip the page, and very thick paper too. It shows an even better view of it, and then an up close, you know, it did a lot of that up close shots and then various versions so that's what I like too this one's one of my favorites love the spider kill and the goo try to find one with like various versions well like this you can see like side by side he did a rough a first for draft on the left on, on this side that was the first draft and that was the final, the one that we're all used to. Very, very similar actually. Uh, some of them were quite different though. Like this one, you can see the original sketch, the black and white sketch there. And then the finished uh, painting without the glare maybe. <laughs> so this was a great book. Uh, I had to have it and it wasn't ridiculously expensive. It's 40 bucks. but. As I was there and I saw it, I went, ring up everything else. Let me see where I'm at. I'm like, ah, I just have to have it. So I got it. And then, yeah, I could show you some of the books that I got. They were pretty cool. Um, let's show you some of the cooler ones. But, I mean, you could gra grab them at random. So Richard Friend was streaming today with Kelsey and they were talking about comic book covers. Uh, so they were highlighting some of the coolest covers. And I mentioned this, and he actually brought up my comment on screen, but he was like, my, my comment was, you know, I just got a bunch of like silver bronze age books and it doesn't matter what issue it is, what comic, you can look at the cover and it's pretty intense, action packed and compelling. It tells a story in one image most of the time. Uh, so I did get this one. It's not worth anything much, but, uh, The Inhumans, number one. Yeah, he had a few of those. Um, or whoever owned this before, I assume a he. Um, a lot of Inhumans. And, like, some, uh, Nova. Some Iron Man. So there's this one, which is classic. So uh, I know a lot of people know this cover. Uh, my friend Belmont did a version of Smokes the Fox with this cover. <laughs> uh, but it was in. Uh, this one's probably about a 6.0 if I had to guess. Maybe a 7. Uh, pretty good shape though. Considering they weren't bagged or boarded, there's just this tiniest bit of spine damage. I mean, really, that's it. So that was pretty cool. Uh, some Red Sonia. We oh got Red Sonia. So some cool Frank Thorne. Red Sonia action. No number one, but it did have number two, which was a cool cover. Try to get these without the glare, but. The covers are just so good from this era. And then, uh, which one's that? Number four. Some cool red Sonya action. Where are these? Some old Submariners. Uh, he had a lot of like Marvel team ups and Marvel two and ones and uh, super villain team ups, stuff like that. Uh, triple action, you know, there's all these like uh, crazy Marvel titles that um, 
that I wasn't even aware of half of those. Like I've heard of the uh, team up and the villain team up or whatever, but it was interesting to see all those. Uh, I had some Luke Cage and Power Man, or uh, Iron Fist and Power Man. That's the half long box, which actually have the smaller bit of titles, but it was still really cool. And then in the big one, let's see, what do we got here? Hit a bunch of Fantastic Four. I mean, just pulling these more or less at random, but that's a cool cover. So sometimes I just look at certain covers and I'm like, it's so freaking badass. Why don't they make covers like this anymore? Um, that one was a cool one with like Dark Phoenix on it. Like with the Phoenix in the background. Really great sh shit. I don't know if that's a John Byrne cover. I'm pretty sure he was doing the art for the book. No, it's Cockrum and Terry Austin. But I know, I know where to go. There we go. One of my favorite John Byrne X-Men covers. So there's this one, which isn't the one I'm talking about, but this one's pretty cool. But this one, this one's a classic. Love it. I've always loved this cover where he's she's breaking the X Men logo, which is super cool. Uh, yeah, so I got all these for twenty five. There's <laughs> the unfortunate thing. The unfortunate thing was that a lot of the key issues were not there for whatever reason, but this one, I mean, it's in really good condition, probably a 7.0, uh, you know, just cool cover. I don't know if this one's a key issue or not, but I wasn't spending a whole lot of time looking up issues. Another cool one with like lots of characters represented. So I had a pretty decent run of Avengers, pretty decent run of uh, uh, Fantastic Four. Here's another cool cover. And again, another one in just really good condition. It's surprising. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. The unfortunate. He had a whole bunch of uh, Incredible Hulk, and as I got to him, I'm like, I started seeing the numbering, and I saw this one, and I knew I was getting close. That was Incredible Hulk uh, 178, and I was about to just jizz in my pants. <laughs> I was like, no way, no way, and then it skipped to 183. There was a gap there, so I figured either somebody savvy picked through it, or uh, they just didn't, uh, unfortuitously, didn't collect those issues. Because there were gaps, and sometimes the gaps weren't, like, missing, like, key issues. They were just gaps. Like, maybe he didn't collect those ones, or whatever. But I'm like, how did he miss this gap? <laughs> now, I'm guessing he probably found out those were worth a bit and got rid of them, especially because of how good a condition these are in. Those would fetch a pretty penny, those 180 and 181 in this condition. So that was a, a kind of an Al Capone's vault kind of disappointment because <laughs> I was going through them. I'm like, no way, no way for 25 bucks. No way. And, uh, yeah, yes way. Yes. I mean, no. What? So yeah, lots of cool stuff. There was a whole bunch of other ones. They also had these. 
It wasn't all of them. I can't remember how many they had. I know there's uh, s the superheroes one, but it's I had to bring on the bad guys. These are kind of in a little messed up shape. I'll have to get special bags for these or something someday, but I don't know if they'll be worth it, but Origins of Marvel Comics. These are pretty cool. I, I, I think there was two others, maybe three. And it'd be cool to track down the others, but as it stands, I've got these ones. So yeah, all that for 25 bucks. That's a, I don't know, just showed a few. That's a long box and a half of comics. <laughs> So even though I was disappointed by that lack of Hulk, there were a cool, a couple cool key issues. Uh, there was a whole run of Thor. There was a couple good ones in there. Uh, the Avengers had a few. Um, those Dark Phoenix ones, mostly for the iconic John Byrne covers, were uh, probably kind of sought after. All in all, definitely a good investment, <laughs> 25 bucks. But I also had to buy a bunch of bags and boards and more long boxes, but. And take up more room in my truck as I try to move. So there's all of that. But, but it was worth it. It was definitely worth it. Ah, uh, let's see. So did a bunch of shit today. Bunch of shit. Like. <laughs> Besides just bagging and boarding a bunch of old comics, which is super fun anyway. That was kind of like after my body was spent from all, because I got up super early because it's like hot out here. So everything I wanted to do, like in my garage where it gets really hot, I wanted to really clean that out and make room so that I could put all the stuff that's going to the dump and then stuff that's going to donation in like two lines in the garage and then kind of clear the house out and move it towards the garage so so that was a big undertaking but it took a lot to like clean the garage this morning also had the power go out this morning which was uh, made things a little hard but anyway <laughs> that is all that is all Let's go. I'm gonna go on to um, some red dwarfage we'll show that um, there's still shit I gotta do tonight, um, even though the sun's gone down and everything. But, uh, let's run through Season 2, the season opener for Season 2. Red Dwarf made it to Season 2, uh, and as they did, they introduced us to a new character, as it were. Uh, let's show this, and go here. Season 2 starts in an odd way. Because it starts with an episode called Crichton. And people who know the series know that Crichton becomes a recurring character. Part of the crew. And it was all set up in this episode that he becomes part of the crew. This is season one, ep season two, episode one. But what happens is... <laughs> you don't see him the rest of season two. And then in season three you see him from then on throughout the history of Red Dwarf. So here we go, Crichton... Uh, season 2 has a very similar opening as Season 1. They show the ship. They have Holly introduce the crew. And end with a little joke. But the season starts. Uh, you see a, a, a maroon ship on an asteroid or a planet. And it zooms in and you find out that the ship is occupied by an android... And he likes watching this soap opera called Androids. <laughs> Actually, they call him a mechanoid, more or less, but um, I don't know what the difference is. Androids. And he loves this show. Everybody loves good androids. Oddly enough, has a very similar title uh, sequence as Red Dwarf. And then we go back to the ship of Red Dwarf. That's just foreshadowing what's to come. And we see Rimmer... An ongoing joke. There's plenty of the start of some ongoing jokes in this episode, or ongoing themes. One is Rimmer constantly trying to learn Esperanto and failing. 
And Rimmer's sitting there, or Lister's sitting there, not even paying attention, and he's picking it up, but Rimmer can't, for some reason. And I don't blame him, Esperanto's a weird language. From what I've picked up from it. We also learn that Lister, another ongoing joke, went to art college, but he only lasted like two days or something like that. <laughs> he talked about how much of a hassle it was waking up at noon and all this shit. Um, but this is just more building the, the loneliness of space, the reality of their inane banter, going back and forth about ridiculous things, trying to learn Esperanto, Lister's cleaning his space bike. And <laughs> then we get to Holly, uh, who gives Rimmer a bunch of shit for not knowing Esperanto. But we also learn that there's a distress call coming from this ship, uh, the Nova 5. That is the ship that Crichton is on. <laughs> Wait, I think this is where Holly um, explains how he invented Hall Rock, where he decimalized it and he changed the notes. He added a new note. <laughs> He's like, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Bo, El, Do, Be, Di. <laughs> Something stupid like that. And you're like, what the fuck? It's so dumb, it's funny. But anyway, Rimmer's like, ah, oh, aliens, you know. And that's another ongoing gag, is that there's no aliens ever on the show. They encounter other life forms. Uh, they're either genetically created, genetically engineered, or they're androids or simulates or something like that. So here's Holly explaining the whole distress call that he got. He also mentions they hope they have some supplies because they ran out of milk. And Rim Lister realizes he's been drinking uh, dog's milk. <laughs> full of vitamins, full of marabone jelly. Uh, so here's Crichton giving the distress call. We're crashed. We need help. He says it's a crew of uh, three women. So that gets, uh, you know, gets the guys excited to meet some women, of course. <laughs> and Rimmer tells him, we'll come and help you or my name isn't Captain Arnold J. Rimmer. But, which is a total lie. There's a great line here where Kat says he's so excited all six of his nipples are tingling. <laughs> and Lister insists, we're just bringing him supplies and helping them out. We're not on the pull. And then it shows this montage of him like getting ready in a fashion of what Rimmer would say is all his least smeggy things. But he takes a sock out of the laundry Sprays it with deodorant, smashes it with a hammer to straight to loosen it up. <laughs> Realizes that uh, he left the iron on his pants, and ingeniously covers it up with spray paint. <laughs> and then Rimmer, obviously dressed to the nine in this uh, regalia. And he's giving Lister a hard time. He's like, ah, oh, you're actually trying, aren't you? And he's like, are you kidding me? Look at you. <laughs> but he starts insulting Rimmer, and Rimmer's like, here we go. This is always the case. You know, like, when we meet girls, you always insult me to make yourself look better. Because they met some girls, and he said, uh, yeah, why don't we uh, meet tomorrow and go to the zoo? And Lister goes, oh, he wants to he wants to introduce you to his mom. <laughs> But as he's explaining it, he's like, oh, how about not insult me? Why don't you uh, build me up? Like, um, call me by my nickname in high school. Ace. <laughs> or Big Man. <laughs> he says, your name was nickname was never Ace in high school. Maybe Ace Hole. But that's, uh, that's another foreshadowing. Because later in an alternate dimension, we'll meet Ace Rimmer. Which is basically the same as Arnold Rimmer. 
only their paths diverged at some point. Uh, parallel dimensions kind of thing. So here's uh, Rimmer telling Lister, oh, you should wear these moon boots. And Lister's like, you said they smelled like whatever. He's like, no, no, definitely wear them. So now we get a scene back into, appearing back into the Nova 5, where we realize that <laughs> all these women are dead. They have been for centuries, uh, more or less. I mean, it's a stupid gag because he would realize that they never actually eat anything, but... So he's prepping them and saying, oh, get ready, the gentlemen are coming, you know, and all that shit, and they're totally dead. They're just skeletons. And we get the cat. This is his costume, which is a gold spacesuit of some kind. Which his spacesuit almost looks more like a 20,000 leagues under the sea kind of outfit, but whatever. And Holly's wearing a toupee. And Lister says, what's that on your head? He says, what head? <laughs> the rug, man. What's the deal with the rug? What are you talking about? And we also learn that Rimmer stuffed socks down his pants. Yeah. They try to look like a big man. As was his nickname, according to him. Rimmer walks aboard and starts speaking Esperanto. Of course, Crichton speaks it fluently. And gives Rimmer a little bit of a hard time. Cat sees a mirror. Can't take himself away. They have to, like, pull him away. <laughs> Because he's so vain, of course. This is where we learn uh, Crichton knows Esperanto, and the Rimmer's like, What'd you say? Oh, CC, si, si, Amor, we. Oui. <laughs> this is where we find out all the ladies are dead. We also have a great moment where, uh, Lister introduces uh, Rimmer to these dead gals. I don't know if you know anything about my friend Ace here. <laughs> but he's incredibly, incredibly brave. He's got just tons of girlfriends. Stuff that Rimmer told him to say. So, one of my favorite lines is, uh, <laughs> Crichton comes back and they all tell him they're dead. And he's like, really? He's like, yes. He's like, well, I was only away two minutes. <laughs> and he's like, you're that sure they're dead? He's like, are you a doctor? <laughs> he's like, what about this one? Remember, says, all, all living people raise your hands, and none of them do. So. so they learn that Crichton's been on a ship with dead girls this whole time. So they take him back as a pity move. Um, you know, he's been programmed to serve the people of the Nova 5. He's having a bit of an issue with it, but as soon as they get back, Rimmer, Rimmer will take it as his charge to give Crichton a whole boatload of chores, as he is a service droid, and uh, you get this little montage of him doing all the tasks that Rimmer has tasked him with. <laughs> which ends with Lister getting back to the, the room and being like what the hell and Lister being a free spirited free minded kind of individual uh, there's a great line he's like these aren't mine they actually bend <laughs> learn that he kept a jar of mold on the counter just because it drove Rimmer mad and that's what keeps him going and he learns that Crichton actually has dreams do androids dream of electric sheep well no he dreams of uh, gardening and he also loves the show androids so as Lister learns about this he realizes there's something in him that's individual and unique and so this is the start of Lister convincing Crichton to break his programming 
And that's an ongoing theme throughout the show as well, as Crichton becomes more and more humanoid uh, in personality as the show goes on. But in this episode, he's played by a different actor, for one. Uh, I can't remember this actor's name. Later, it becomes Robert Llewellyn, who plays Crichton in season three and going forward. But Lister, to help him break his programming, decides to show him decides decides to show him uh, a bunch of movies about rebellion. One of them being Rebel Without a Cause, James Dean. I uh, showed him like Easy Riders, uh, things like that. So as the episode comes to an end, and you get Crichton painting list uh, painting Rimmer to uh, a portrait of him. At the end, <laughs> at the end of the episode, you get Crichton showing the final product of this portrait, which is glorious. Which ends with Crichton saying, uh, well, I'll tell you in a sec. And Lister, or Rimmer, I always keep fucking up their name. Rimmer is treating him like a dog. He's like, he likes commands. He does what he's told. And here's the portrait. Him sitting on the can. <laughs> he says, what are you doing? He says, I think I'm rebelling. He says, rebelling? Rebelling against what? And he goes, what do you got? <laughs> just like James Dean on Rebel Without a Cause and this is his big protest to Rimmer and the episode <laughs> him flipping him off saying swivel on it and he's got his biker outfit which looks more like Rob Halford from Judas Priest <laughs> that's his rebellion and thus ends the episode Crichton. Uh, like I said, lots of foreshadowing of themes and jokes that are recurring. And uh, an excellent episode. One of my favorites. Uh, even though I don't particularly like that act, I like that actor and I think he did a good job. But once Robert Llewellyn became Crichton, I just got so used to him playing Crichton that it really change the whole game so so yeah and then you don't see Crichton like apparently that all happened like that would have made sense at the end of season 2 and then season 3 Crichton's there but season 3 there's a whole bunch of changes wholesale changes and uh, so that's all retconned and things like that but the rest of season two, Crichton is gone. Uh, season two, they really start getting their traction as far as, uh, you know, you got an idea for the characters, the jokes come a little easier without having to, like, set that up once it's already established. So, so anyway, that is uh, Crichton, the opener for season two. Um, yeah, like I said, I got more shit I got to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get to it. Uh, like I said, a lot of big changes. Uh, a lot of shit going on. Um, and I'm excited for it all. You know, and as far as like most people around these parts that probably know me from my YouTube presence are mostly interested in Shove, which that is like the coolest news in so many ways, you know, it's, it's almost like I would have been so anxious and so focused on that aspect. And luckily I've had James helping me because with everything going on with the move, I don't know if I could have given it my proper attention. And so I've been leaning on him to, to help with that. And he's done a fantastic job, really helpful uh, not, you know, he did the lettering, he, uh, did edits and then all the pre-press work, man, uh, like all that stuff is just loads off my shoulder, uh, to know that he was taking care of that. Now it said, like I've done everything all the way leading up to that. So it was weird to kind of like hand the ball off a little bit on something that was so attached to me personally. Um, 
because it's also printing in Canada. Uh, James's printer, well, it's our printer for Broken Compass at the moment, at least. And he's always done a good job, so. As far as I can tell, for the near future, will be our printer. Um, so that, I mean, all that fulfillment should be happening very soon. Like I said, the, the weird part about it is it's like the timing. Everything's just happening all at once. So much going on in life. But I was talking to someone, an older fe fella, who uh, was a good friend. And at, I don't know what he is, like 71 maybe? Somewhere in that range, right around 70. He moved away from this house that he'd been living in for a long time with his wife and they, they moved back into town and he's having, now he's done this process before, but building on a new property, a whole new house and he's overseeing every aspect of it because uh, he was a project manager most of his life. And so all this big change for him, they're living in an apartment at the moment, they're going to move into this house and you know, he's talking with all these contractors doing all this work. And I was having lunch with him, and it was just like, I'm like, that's the thing, though. Like, once your life quits having flux, like, in flux, like, life should constantly, constantly be in flux. Once you get, like, too settled, too uh, solidified in your own little world and what you're doing, that's almost where you got to worry, you know, like, uh, that you're going to grow old too fast. I don't know. Like, to me, uh, even in an advanced age, like my friend, you know, like, make some moves. Do some things that are that are going to shake things up. Now, I have a lot shaken up right now. But I had been kind of static in a lot of ways. And I'd rather be in flux. But that said, once I get out there, I want to get settled and feel settled for a bit at least you know I know I'll be out there at least until my youngest graduates at least which will put me at six years six years for sure that I'm gonna be in that Missouri area near Springfield but the job that I got you know it's a job I could retire with and be very happy um, from what I can tell. I guess I haven't done it yet. But the way the company has treated me so far, I don't doubt that. And the way it's like a new position and I'll be spearheading all the movement in that area, uh, which I like. I don't like coming into somebody else's procedures and way of doing things and everybody's used to that. Like, I have a way of doing things. I want to do it my way. So that'll be cool. You know, I'll work, you know, I don't want to be like, I'm doing it my way no matter what. But, you know, I'll work with them, obviously. But um, that gives it, like, it's riveting. It's exciting. It's more uh, interesting to me to walk into that situation knowing that I'm creating the process from the ground up rather than walking into somebody else's processes and procedures and style and what everyone's gotten used to and they'll go yeah well so and so did it this way you know like there's not gonna be any of that it's gonna be like uh we've never done this so you tell us what do we, what do we need to do um so that'll be great that's got me excited like the excitement about the new job and the new area but like when it all comes down to it I miss my kids like terribly and this entire time that we've tried to do this long term or long distance and long time frames without them like I couldn't explain it any better than I was talking to somebody and I said uh, I don't feel like a dad right now you know I feel like I've got kids out there but I don't, you know, I talk to them on the phone, but I'm not seeing them enough. And I don't feel like, you know, 
if they've got some cool thing they're involved with that they, you know, I just want to be there to support. And uh, so all of the, the coolness of the, the moving and the excitement, like I want to feel back in the saddle in that aspect more than anything in the world. So that's what I'm looking forward to most. Now that is a more natural thing, like the, the job though, it's gonna require, you know, like I've mentioned before, it's gonna require creative energy. But I'm also, you know, in the evenings, on weekdays when I won't have my girls, you know, it'll be like, it'll be a lot of getting back to uh, just putting my head down and drawing and I, I get to recreate my life, you know, like how it's structured. Like I go to work, I come home, you know, those kind of structures you know it'd be great to get back into like working out they have a full gym that's 24 7 at the office i could go in there anytime and that would be cool but that's the thing when you get this fresh coat of paint you get to like reinvigorate uh areas that maybe you got complacent so i think like physically that might be a thing. Um, but yeah, all that's going to take creative energy. But I also have to, like, I'll, I'll create into my life a great amount of time, because it does take a great amount of time, to draw, um, to create pages for a shove, and also to, you know, make my rounds on, on shows and streaming and things. So... Once I get settled, um, you know, I'll get to create a new life in that cer certain sense. It won't be that much different than what I'm doing now, but uh, it it'll take a little while to get settled. So, anyway, that's uh, that's all. I mean, it's big news for me. Uh, in the moment, you know, I can make these videos, and from the outside looking in, you're like, "Wow, big changes," you know, but. I'm like living in that moment so like Friday was my last day at this job and like this weekend I got a lot done but I've got this whole week basically this whole week to just get everything freaking done and that's gonna be my goal and I think I can do it uh, there's I'm contemplating selling some things even though I don't like dealing with people uh, there's some things that are like beyond just donating that I'm like you should try to make a few bucks <laughs> you know like you've got some things that are worth some money like sell them make a few bucks at least uh but I just don't like dealing with Craigslist or marketplace or any of that shit or people so that's my conundrum but I'll figure that out anyway that's where we're at that's what we're doing that's my life anyway and I hope in your life that if it's in as crazy flux as mine right now, that's awesome. Like, enjoy it. Like, even this. Like, um, every step of this process I'm trying to enjoy. Uh, so that way, like, when the big change comes, like, I'm just riding this uh, enjoyment wave. <laughs> um, but wherever you're at, I hope that it's the same way. Like, if you got a lot, of, a lot in flux, like, don't feel bad. Or, like, a lot of big changes, don't feel bad. Actually, uh, be happy. Because, again, that's, that's like, keeping you young. And if you're not having a lot of big changes, that's fine, too. Enjoy those moments while they last. And hopefully they don't last too long until they just drag you down into complacency. But. But, yeah. <laughs> Everybody, as always, I hope you're doing pure awesome. You're kicking ass. Whatever you're facing in life, that you're facing it with confidence, courage, um, power, authority, awesomeness, uh, care for the love, loved ones around you, of course, and above all, integrity, which encompasses all those things. And, uh, yeah, with that, I will leave you all. Until next time, this is Odin. Take care, and we'll see you next time.